Our next speaker is not the least, is uh, Professor uh, Tom Baden from University of Sussex. I will expand on his uh, biography a little bit because he's an example for us. He's a, a research group. His research group is focusing on uh, visual neurophysiology. But before that, he did his bachelor, master, and PhD degree at the University of Cambridge in the uh, uh, United Kingdom, followed by postdoctoral research at the Center for Integrative Neuroscience uh, and uh, Ben Stein Center for Computational and uh, Neuroscience and at, at the Institute of uh, Ophthalm uh, Ophthalm Ophthalmic Research at the University of Tübingen. He is currently the director of uh, Sussex Center for Sensory Neuroscience and uh, Computations, and uh, elected from uh, elected fellow for Federation of uh, European Neuroscience, and also elected fellow for Royal Society of uh, Biology. He is a multi award. He received many award in the neuroscience, and especially uh, award from. Uh, Eppendorf Prize and onto. But at the side of uh, the research he's doing, this is uh, a key point I want to mention. Professor Tom Baden, he is uh, a co founder of Trend in Africa. The Trend in Africa is uh, probably something that brought most of us into this uh, today. And uh, this is uh, uh, something I would like. Uh, So currently, he is also a founder of uh, Open uh, Lab, where, where he is trying to collaborate with uh, African uh, University to promote an open source and open access model to scientific research and foster African-European collaboration and exchange. On that word, uh, Professor Tom Baden, I give you uh, the word to tell us about uh, vision in zebrafish. Well, thank you, Rauf, for this wonderful introduction, and thank you, Mahmoud, and everyone else for the invite. Um, so yes, I'm I'm quite delighted to be here, and I have to say the the whole exercise of setting up by your RTC and everything is this this is really this this, this is very emotional for us here, Trent, because this is kind of what we've been trying to aim at for many years that we can support African-based scientists enough so they can develop and then themselves set up institutes of this scale and, and eventually bring, bring African science to the fore. Um, because the change that we see in Africa, it can only come from Africa, it cannot come from abroad. Um, so I, I just wanted to emphasize how I think, how I think this, is, this is fundamental, this is the way to do it. Um, I'm also delighted to see Mahmoud from the little video that you showed of all the equipment that you're already out of space. So you may have to do something about that um, with more equipment coming in. Okay, so um, I will give you a very brief and high level overview of some of the sort of things that we do in the lab. So I will not be talking about trend, I will be talking about some of our research in the lab at Sussex. Um, and I've decided to try to keep it short and sweet. Let's see how that goes. Um, so let me let me share my screen. Does this come out all right? Okay, I'm uh, assuming. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. So. We do a lot of stuff in the lab, but one of the sort of key focuses of many, many, many efforts that we have is around color vision in general in, in vertebrates. So, um, so that means humans, but we don't really work on humans. We use as a model um, quite a lot of different vertebrates, but in particular, we use zebrafish. Um, and there's a reason for that. So if I may just jump in straight away to how we currently think that primates, including humans, 
C color. So solve the problem of discriminating wavelength information, which is color information, from intensity information, which you might uh, consider to be sort of black and white, like a black and white photograph. That's the intensity information and then the color information sort of sits on top of that. So the way that the primates are thought to solve this is they have three types of photoreceptors, cone type photoreceptors in their eye. We call them the blue one, the green one, and the red one. Uh, hello, Tom. We can't see your slide. Sorry. You cannot. Yes. That is surprising. Okay. Um, let me click some buttons. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. I was just, I didn't click all of the buttons. But now we, now, but, oh, fantastic. Good, good, good. Are we good? Yeah. All right, so let's see. Final access. Right, so um, so here, the, this is the three photoreceptors in the primate eye. Um, and we call them blue, green, and red, uh, simply because of the wavelength range of light, of what we call visible light that they respond to, right? So this guy is the blue one, the green one, and the red one. And then at a circuit level, both at the level of the retina and also in the brain, um, there are three fundamental computations that happen. One is very simple. We just take the signal from all three cones together, we pool them, and then we get what we call the achromatic dimension. So this is black and white vision. But then instead of doing this very simple thing, what we can also do is we can contrast the signals from the green ones and the red ones. It gives us a green red axis. So that's the thing that allows us to spot apples in, a, in the forest, for example. Um, and then Yet another thing that we do is we combine the green and the blue, uh, the red, which gives us yellow, and we contrast that again at a circuit level against blue, against the blue cones in isolation, and that gives us the blue yellow axis. Now, traditionally, we call this the achromatic axis. We call this the ancestral color axis because this is very well shared across species, and we call this a sort of a primate special red green axis. Most mammals cannot do this, but most mammals can do this, like a mouse, for example. Okay, so this is how we think about color in mammals. The funny thing though is that if you look at the vast majority of vertebrates, which are not mammals, they tend to come with four of these, not three of these. So that immediately implies then that all of these species might have color vision that is somehow possibly superior to what we have. And at the very least, it's gonna be different. So unlike what we've learned in the primates and, and non-primate mammals, how this works at a circuit level is essentially not understood. Um, so as part of our research in the lab, we're trying to understand, okay, so how, how does this four cone situation work? And do, in this case, a zebrafish have better color vision than other, than for example us. So um, what we can do is we can look very simply at a evolutionary perspective. Um, so if we just think about the photoreceptors, we don't think about the rest of the circuits at all, already there, we can link individual types of photoreceptors across essentially the entire tree of, uh, the vertebrate tree of life. So for example, what we call in apes, including our own eyes, what we call the blue photoreceptors, here highlighted in pink, um, is the same photoreceptor that also mice have, in which case it's a UV photoreceptor, but it's also the same photoreceptor that a zebrafish has, or even that a lamprey has, which is sort of one of the, the oldest vertebrates on the planet today. And that means that this same photoreceptor must be ancient. It must predate or be at least present in the last common ancestor of all vertebrates. And that happened in the Cambrian explosion about 550 million years ago, right? So just, just for reference, just to put this into perspective, the dinosaurs got extinct 65 million years ago. So this is almost an order of magnitude older, right? So these circuits are truly ancient. Now we can do the same exercise for the red cones. So in the primate has them, the mouse has them, the fish has them, and the lamprey has them. Therefore, they are also old. But we can't do this exercise for the middle two cones for the uh, fish, and we can't do it for the middle cone and the apes. This one here is very, very new. It came basically, um, only some primates even have it. So this is sort of 
tens of millions of years old, it's not that old at all. And mammals, unlike pretty much everyone else, have lost in their evolutionary history the middle two ones. Okay, so if we think in terms of evolution, we had four old ones. Very early, we had this split, which I'm not going to talk about. That gives us four cones and the rods, which I also won't talk about. Then the mammals lost two, basically when the dinosaurs first emerged, which is roughly around here. And they've stuck with that for millions and millions of years until very, very recently, some primates duplicated one of them and then got back this trichromatic vision. This middle one here indicated in red, that's actually what we call the green one. But it's not to be confused with the ancestral green one, which zebra fish still have. Okay. So if we compare that more broadly, you can see that amphibians, reptiles, and birds, they are like the fish, but if anything, better, because they have the same photoreceptors plus some extra ones. Yeah, so this is the ancestral motifs. I'm not going to talk about sharks and rays, there's a bit different, but basically the vast majority of vertebrates have these four rather than two of three that we have in the mammals. Now, then the big question becomes, what's so special about these guys? Why, why, did, why did mammals lose them and what, what, what do they do in a fish? So one way to solve this is to record from them in a species that still has them. And so zebrafish here, filmed in India where they are endemic, um, still have all the four photoreceptors. And so we asked quite recently the question, what do all of these photoreceptors do, especially in view of understanding what the middle two do? So just to give you a flavor of the sort of experiments that we then do in the lab, and I'm quite delighted that this is actually Takeshi's work who was hosting the last session and who's talking in a minute. Um, the sort of thing that you can do, and you can do this with any neuron in the retina of these ever fish, but specifically here for the red photoreceptors, for the red cone photoreceptors, what we can do is we can express a biosensor that tells us about activity in this neuron by way of getting brighter or dimmer, um, specifically in these neurons. So if you stick it in the red cones, then, and you use a two photon microscope to look at the synaptic terminals of these red cones, you can see something like this. Each of these blobs is one photoreceptor of the red variety. And then, so if you take the signal from a cone like this and you stimulate it with light, very simply, you have to stimulate it with very red light, with orange light, with green light, with blue light, with UV light. And we basically get the tuning function of this neuron, right? So it doesn't respond very well here. It starts to respond when you go orange, then it sort of stops again as you go towards the blues, yeah? So you basically get a tuning function. And this is plotted here. And notice that this is reversed twice. It's reversed on the y-axis because photoreceptors are hyperpolarizing cells when you activate them, which is always confusing. And because here we stimulated red to UV, but traditionally you plot these things from UV to red. So these are double flipped. Okay, so we get a red curve like this. Now we can do exactly the same exercise for all the other photoreceptors. And here's just some examples of how that looks. So for example, if you now look in the green one, it works just as well as it does in the red one, but the signal is very different. First of all, you do get this hyperpolarizing response here that you also see in the red cones, but it's actually quite small and it's shifted in terms of wavelength. It responds more to green light, that is expected. But what is not expected is that it responds in the wrong way round to red light. Okay, so that means that these are not just green photoreceptors. These are photoreceptors that distinguish red light from green light, which is very different from what the red ones do, which only respond to red light. Yeah. Then the blue ones are like the green ones um, in the sense that they also have the zero crossing, but the wavelength range they cover is different. And then finally, the UV one is a little bit like the red one just shifted in that it responds now to UV light. Now, if you think about this situation very simply in comparing now what we have in a fish and what we have in a mammal, like a mouse, the mouse has this one and this one, but it's missing the middle two, right? So the mouse is fundamentally missing whatever this computation enables the zebrafish to do. It's only having the detectors. It doesn't have these contrasting channels. Um, now, 
we can do this many, many times. And I just want to show you that you get reliably these tuning functions. And uh, in the case of the red and then the UV, notice that these curves superimpose well with these thick curves. Those are the curves that are the direct prediction from the opsin, which is expressed in this photoreceptor. So this is a protein that responds to light, basically. Um, and depending which protein you put there, you get different sensitivities. So the red and the UV are very simple. They are basically explained by the protein that they have. But the green and the blue are not, ex not explained by this. So this is a circuit computation. It's basically something that the retina adds after it has the protein in the photoreceptor and the signal gets picked up in the first place. And then what basically Takeshi showed is how this is generated at the circuit level. I'm not going to get into this. I will just point out if the horizontal cells doing it, which is a population of lateral inhibitory neurons. Um, but then we also asked, so what's the point of this? And this is now cutting a very long story, very short. And basically what we've been able to show by comparing the spectral tuning functions that we measure in these animals and the distribution of light in the natural environment of the zebrafish. So this is literally going into the field and measuring the wavelength distribution of light where zebrafish evolved. Um, we could show that the red channel that we see is basically a grayscale channel, meaning that the tuning that it has doesn't just mean it responds to red light, it means it responds to light because the spectrum of the light in the natural environment of the zebrafish has the same tuning as that photoreceptor. So when the red photoreceptor is activated, that means there was light, but it doesn't tell you about the color. But then once you've done this computation, then the green photoreceptor, basically it doesn't tell you about brightness at all because if, there's, if the light is of if the light has this spectrum, then half the light will activate it and half the light will inactivate it, and then you get net zero. So you don't get a response to brightness changes in the green cone, but you do get an optimal response to wavelength changes around this axis. And basically what this means is that the green cone is a color cone. When the green cone changes activity, that means there was a colorful stimulus in the world. And the blue cone, um, basically complements this color function that the green one has. Um, and that is basically how color is done in a zebrafish. And then what happens in the UV is that it's sort of, it's extra, it's sitting on the side, it's doing something else. Um, and I think Takeshi is going to talk quite a, a, a little bit about what the UV cone might be up to. I just want to give you a little hint of one of the things that it might be good for, that we think is good for, and that is to highlight food underwater. So this is a very simple experiment here now. Um, we're literally taking a camera and looking at an aquarium. And the aquarium has some rocks and some water, of course. Um, and then with the red, uh, with the red filters, with a filter that sort of mimics what the red photoreceptor will see, you will get an image like this, right? So it's very, it's, there's nothing special here. You see the rocks, you see the water column, you see the, the surface reflection. But what you don't see, is all of these white little dots that you can see in the UV channel. So this is what, the, what, what they would see in UV. In the UV channel, you don't see any of this stuff. You don't see the rocks, you don't see the water column. You just see this extreme brightness gradient and you see these little white dots flying around. Each of these little white dots is a paramecium. Paramecia are zebrafish food. They're basically these single cell tiny little organisms that float around in the water. And just by the, the, the physics, of how these paramecium's scatter light as the UV light rays from the sun hit them, um, they generate this effect of these bright dots. So basically, by being able to see UV, zebrafish have a basically, they have a food channel almost. Like every time a UV cone is active, chances are a food has just swim by, so they can go and they can eat it. Of course, that is a very powerful evolutionary pressure for the zebrafish to have these UV cones. Now, I just want to point out that the comparison between red and UV, that's not just something that's useful for fish, right? So you can do kind of the same thing above the water. Um, so for example, if you take a picture using a red filter of the sky and a tree and that sort of thing, you will see some clouds, you will see the tree, of course. But if you take the same picture with a UV camera, you will still see the tree, but you don't really see the clouds anymore. You go straight and looking into this into into space basically. 
And that is because UV light basically goes through the clouds. It doesn't really get stopped by the clouds, which is also the reason that white people at least get sunburn um, even when there's clouds, right? So you can laugh at us. Um, so, uh, so there's is, there is something about UV that is special even above the water. And for species such as mice, um, it might actually help them to see predatory birds and things like that. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the thing in the bottom here. And, um, and just to sort of highlight how this might be important, okay? So now we've got the photoreceptors, we've seen what they do, but the retina has a lot of other neurons that come later. So all of this information gets further processed and further processed, and then it gets sent to the brain and then it gets processed some more until eventually the animal decides to do something with that information, right? So we can look at all of these circuits and ask similar kinds of questions. And for example, just very briefly, we've done one set of experiments where we've looked at the next layer here in the retina bipolar cells. And what we find there is that the bipolar cells basically copy what the cones do, but then they take, they, in addition to that, they take the same signal and they duplicate it and form two new functions. One of the functions is a very broadband signal, one that's basically complementing the red cones for the brightness encoding. And then the second one, is it takes the UV cones and it contrasts them to all other cones. Um, and the reason why we think this might be important is you do get an achromatic image with the red photoreceptors. This is now taken underwater with red. And you do get a very useful achromatic image also with the UV photoreceptors. And notice you see different kinds of things in the water, depending which one you use. But even better by using those two separately, even better is to just combine them and contrast them, right? So if you take this image, flip it, and put it on top of that one, you get all of the information in a single information stream. And we think that's what this is for. And just to point out again, that we think the same thing, the exact same thing happens in mice, and therefore probably exact same thing happens in humans. Here we've got the UV photoreceptor of the mouse, here we've got the red photoreceptor of the mouse. This is data taken from collaborators in Germany. Um, and both of these channels are useful in isolation. But if you combine them, either this way round or this way round for these two channels, you can see there's simply more stuff to be seen, right? So combining these two channels, I think, is a very fundamental way of enhancing the contrast that we can see in nature. Now. To sum up, um, without going into the circuit detail, we think that in zebrafish, we know there's in zebrafish, there's four cone types and they lead at the level of the inner retina to six spectral motifs. The central four of which are already present in the cones. And they have this new broadband signal and they've got this new tertiary color signal, which is the one I've just talked about, the UV versus red one. Now, if you think about what might have happened in terms of evolution, when uh, mammals came onto the land and they went nocturnal during the age of the dinosaurs, they lost the middle two photoreceptors and therefore they also lost these color channels, which are quite optimal in the zebrafish. But that means they still have that one left, the funny one, okay? So this basically then becomes what the mouse is today, which is mostly achromatic, but with this one color signal that, it, that they have, which is probably for contrast. And then much later still, the primates emerged. What the primates did is they duplicated the red cone into a spare red cone, which is slightly different, which we call the green cone now. And that basically means they could inherit all of the circuits from the mouse, so the primate has them too, and invent one new channel, which compares the red with this not quite red channel, which we call the green. And that, again, is then the basis of our own trichromatic vision, where we have an achromatic channel, we've got the ancient color axis, and we've got the new color axis. And I think this is pretty much at least a guiding principle by which to think about how our own color vision could have evolved from the earliest vertebrate ancestors. So with this, I want to close, and I want to thank the people that did the work, most notably Takeshi, also, Philip here and Cornelius and Philip, those are the German collaborators. Um, of course, the lab and the funding. And I want to thank all of you for your attention. Okay.
Okay, uh, thank you, Tom, for such a great talk. So I think that we still have uh, three minutes and uh, in which we could uh, take questions for participant or for panel. I have a question if there is. Okay, go ahead, uh, Muhammad, please. Tom, what do you think a lab like BioRTC can do to improve such kind of visual news and research like you've had uh, professor Lopa mentioned all the different things that africa could offer have we learned about the vision in all things that are available say in africa if you can just you know expansiate on these kind of things absolutely so um and i think there's a very valid point to say that understanding vision in a truly general sense, will require understanding vision in a large number of very different animals. And Africa has a lot of species that live nowhere else on the planet. Therefore, from first principles, this work cannot, can never be complete without African contribution. So there are some species that are quite well studied, which are only living in Africa, especially amongst the fish. So for example, there are African cichlids, they live mostly in the freshwater lakes in East Africa. Um, and currently, unfortunately, what happens a lot is that Western scientists fly in, study the fish and then fly out and then they publish their results. So this is absolutely an area where African scientists can and should get more involved, describing these species, understanding what is there, understanding how they're visual systems function, not just the visual systems, of course, right? This is just one example. Um, so the cichlids are just one example, but there's, there's so many species out there that only exist in Africa. And I think absolutely a lab like BioITC could very, in a real way, contribute to this field, right? So um, the simplest thing, for example, to do would simply be do retinal anatomy. So you get the species, you get the retina and you, you stain the retina, you see what's there, you look at the neuron types. We can learn a huge deal from anatomy alone. But then going forward, it's absolutely possible to get transcriptomic data from these animals, which would be extremely helpful. Um, again, the equipment for that now sits in at BioRTC. It just needs to be used. So it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> 